Welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Hello everyone, I hope you're all well and thanks for listening to another episode. Um, we'll be putting up some more episodes soon. Keep your emails coming in, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Today I'm going to be talking to Tanya Joya, uh, the ex-wife of one of ISIS's top commanders. So uh, let's go straight into the interview. Uh, settle down, relax and please enjoy it. Thank you. So my next guest is Tanya Joya. Uh, she's the ex-wife of one of ISIS's most senior commanders, Yahya Abu Hassan, a.k.a. John Georgilus, an American who she was married to for 10 years. Uh, this led her and her family to Syria, uh, which she fled in 2013 to start a new life away from Islamic extremism to a more suburban life in the U.S. Welcome to True Sentinel, Tanya. Thank you. Um, it's an honour to be here. Uh, let's start with your life when you were younger and lived in the UK, in the same place that I usually live, um, which is Harrow. Can you talk about what life was like uh, starting from that point? That I was asked a similar question to yours, your first memories of Harrow, and I said racism, because that was in the 80s. <laughs> and I feel like in the 80s there were different levels of tolerance and um, so. You know, when you're living next door to bad neighbors, you have German shepherds that attack you. It's just like horrific. And, you know, I felt like I was being terrorized. Um, but there were ex-convicts and, and that cases. But so I lived, you know, I lived right next to St. Anne's. So it's, I'm, I'm certain it's completely changed now. But to go back also on my childhood, I was really, you know, very poor family. Um, and, ben, you know, came from a Bengali culture and culturally religious and you know girls are worth half of boys and we got treated you know girls got treated like servants and 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 we weren't valued so you know like I wasn't raised to be a free-thinking independent-minded strong woman it was be obedient don't cause shame on the family and then get married off um, so it's like, you know, I wasn't like taught good values like humanist values or a respect human rights or the, or the law of the land and, you know, none of that. I wasn't brought up hearing messages like that. It was also more like, you, you're a Muslim, you, you can't have boyfriends, you, you're a Muslim, you can't eat pork or you can't drink alcohol or you can't have parties or you can't hang out, you can't wear short skirts, everything, everything that meant I, every time I wanted to assimilate to British society, it was haram, mm -hmm. all brought shame. So, you know, it's conf when I was young, I just felt completely conflicted. And, and no, it wasn't the racism in the 80s that bothered me. I, I saw, like, it's not racism, but like ethnic um, ethnicism, I call, like within the Asian community, all the multi, all the subcultures and uh, multi, ethnic communities didn't like each other, they were hostile to each other and I'm pretty sure that's because none of their leaders in the community were teaching um, secular uh, values and you know just to how to like respect your neighbor and, and diversity. But when I was about teenage, when I was a teenager I started feeling you know I was yeah, every teenager they're going through these crazy hormonal hormones that, and we don't understand what's going on. And uh, but I was angry. I was like really angry about being alive because I thought this was just su such a. I thought if it if this is God controlling it, it's a really messed up game. So I was depressed, and then um, and, and nobody cared. And you know, you you need you, adolescents need people who care. Otherwise, it's just you know they're gonna look for they're gonna look for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. What was your uh, school life like? Were you uh, going to a local school around there? I went to Vaughan Primary School. I went to Whitmore High School. I went to uh, Harrow College for one year. Then I dropped out. And then I went to Barking Abbey when I was old um, for my first year. And then I dropped out again because that's when I was like becoming more radicalized, and I wasn't like. I lost all interest in, I, I became so anti-Western because I thought it was like I was being institutionalized and at that point I was so like involved or like so 
taken with Islamic way, the Islamic way of thinking, the anti-Western uh, rhetoric it gives, I felt like, oh, Western education is going to brainwash me, and and you know, but really I was being brainwashed by Wahhabis. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you about the religious side of things. So did you feel you were being controlled by people or was it the religion that was controlling you? Um, both. Uh, people, definitely, because it was the people who pushed the religion on me. You know, after school, I, every day we had to go read the Quran at somebody's house for one hour or two hours. We don't understand anything we're reading. We just have to read, like, in a Persian Arabic script and then not lo not know what it's saying. And it, it's really what my parents and other parents should be doing is investing that time in for kids to do their school homework and have activities. Not It was, it was completely, like, a waste of time. And I had to do that for so many years. But it also, they kept telling us it's from God, so we really believed, okay, we're doing this because... It pleases God. It sounds like you didn't like the control so much, so I wondered why you felt like you, be, you became more interested in the religious side of things when it sounded like you didn't really like the control. No, I didn't like the cultural side of religion at all, mm. like Bengali culture. But I, I think as like I was looking for an identity, and I was as I was getting old, I started feeling like I'm, I'm like either cursed by God or God doesn't like me because it's just terrible things happening in my life. And I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't know the psychology and, and I didn't understand that I was maybe depressed. I needed maybe antidepressants or something. Um, and it wasn't just me. It was my entire family were like depressed. And so I, you know, I used religion as a way to make myself feel better and like make me feel like I have a purpose in life and um, you know there's something to do and it's not all about materialism and who's got what and who can show off that's how much the I felt the 90s was really shallow really shallow time period um, did have some good music and, though yeah <laughs> the R&B was good <laughs> um, but, um, what first caused you to have uh, start to develop extremist sort of jihadi views then? Okay, so I, I started a new school in Essex. And, um, you know, I, I had always been this very rebellious uh, child because my mum couldn't handle me. And she couldn't handle me because she didn't even want her own children. She only wanted foster children because that's how she had an income coming in. So we didn't get along too well. And then... Um, I had to go stay with other relatives, and they taught me about um, they taught me about British imperialism. And then at school, the girls would invite me over to their houses after school, and their parents would teach me about the Cold War and um, the effects of cold, the Cold War, and and all you know. I, I, they were giving me what I thought was my history because I thought, well, I'm a Muslim and I need to, I need to know my history. And because, you know, in the school system, I was never going to learn Muslim history, of course, because it's up to the parents to teach that. But my parents never taught me a single thing other than how to cook and clean. So uh, because, again, I was like a servant to them. Um, so I was exposed to these new ideas and politics and then how... I was like, wow, you know, we're actually, the, the, I, I knew that Muslims got blamed for everything, you know, at that time, because I was studying politics, and I, I I saw the Intifada, and then when September 11th happened, I went to my friend, and I spoke to her, and I was like, yeah, everyone always blames the Muslims for everything, but then gradually I learned the, poli the political side of the Muslim world versus the West and, and everywhere else. And how did you come to... Um to meet your uh, now ex-husband, uh, Yaya. Yeah, so I was uh, on a march for uh, Stop the War in Iraq, and there were some guys, They weren't. it wasn't even pamphlets they were giving, it was like little strips of paper, the cheapest thing they had, right? And it said www.muslimmatrimonies.com. So I'm, I was at the protest, I had a hijab, they walked over, they gave it to me, I went to the website, and then John kept pestering me, and I kept saying, you know, it took a while for me to like say, okay, fine. Um, and that's how we met. And then he was in Syria at the time. He was 19, but he left when he was 17. And then um, 
he came over to London and we got married in 2000. Yeah. And did did, he, did you already know that he had kind of extremist views himself then? Yeah, I mean, we the goals were, we, we married each other just for the goals. We had the same goals. We wanted, um, we want, we wanted to make hijra, which means migration for the sake of God, like the pilgrims did, you know, when traveled because they thought they were being persecuted. And then, um, uh, we wanted, we, yeah, we wanted a family, a big family, and we thought, well, it's more affordable to have a big family there, um, in the Middle East. I mean, um, we didn't want to live in a non-Muslim, we, we agreed that we shouldn't live in a Muslim country that pays taxes, that and those taxes are used to kill our Muslim community. So we thought, okay, so it's when as Muslims we're not allowed to live in the countries that are at war with our people. Um, so we had this understanding, and we wanted to go to the Holy Land, which is Sham, Sham being Syria, um, Lebanon, and Palestine, Israel area, and a bit of Turkey. So we had religious goals and. Um, John was always hoping that, you know, he, he was a religious Christian before he was a religious Muslim. And he was always waiting for the coming of the Messiah because he really believed that it was going to happen and he wanted to be there. Mm, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, because I know, um, we'll move on to it later, but you've kind of changed religions as well. So he, he was a Christian, then became a Muslim. I mean, I know there is a connection there. It's basically. Just, I'm not a Christian, but. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it seems um, that was quite a leap. Then did was that did that take a lot of time for him to to turn from being a Christian to a Muslim? Then? Uh, no, I don't think so. He was uh, he was studying philosophy at a community college, and um, so that you know he had a and he was um, doing a lot of work in the church too. But then eventually he was saying the Trinity doesn't make any sense, so he started wandering around looking for other religions. And then he read about Buddhism, and he was a humanist for a while. Then he was like, "No, I can't deny God." And then, then he found, then he started studying um, the Aryan. It's not the Aryan, or some. It was some Christian sect before the Orthodox religion who said that Jesus isn't a god and he's just a prophet. And then, since they were all wiped out, they were killed by the Orthodox Christians. The only other religion that came similar to that, the Aryan. Aryan, I can't remember, so the Aryan something, um, was Islam with the monotheist aspect. You were both, you both, um, shared the same, um, beliefs at that time. Um, what, what, what developed from that stage? Did you, was that when you decided to go to Syria later? Oh, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened in Syria then? What was it like, um, living in Syria together? You know, I had a good time there. It was, you know, we were only 19 going on 20 and we got to meet lots of interesting people and, you know, learn about a new culture and the Syrian people were extremely friendly, the best people I've ever met. So generous. They, they were, you know, they see, they're not used to foreigners there. So at that time, it was 2003 and so they would see John and me walking down the streets of the souk in the market and they would invite us into their homes and we'd drink tea and they were, they were just so fascinated and they wanted to know where, where we came from and they were very friendly. Yeah, it was nice. And uh, so at first the, your marriage was quite happy, would you say then? The way I saw it was, it's not like I had been, I had fallen in love with him first. It was love had to come gradually. Um, but yeah, we were like friends, you know, friends traveling together. That's how it was. It, sometimes he really annoyed me. Um, he was quite, always chauvinistic and his, his opinions just bothered me. He was terribly controlling, but you know, I just used to try and think of the positive things, the positive qualities he has. And there wasn't much I could do because he wasn't going to give me a divorce. In, in Islam, a Muslim woman cannot get a divorce unless without her husband's permission. So when I did, I remember when I got pregnant for the first time, I wanted a divorce, but he wasn't going to give me one. Um, so, and I didn't have any family to go back to. Uh, I had nowhere to go. So I just, uh, I just, you know, felt trapped. And what was uh, what made you decide um, it was time to actually leave uh, the relationship and Syria? Oh yeah, so I wanted to leave, but I just 
for the longest time. Um, but I couldn't. Like, I stopped reading the Quran in 2009. That's when I just had enough of the Quran because I said, all it does is make me feel guilty about stuff that I that is not within my control. I can't save the whole world, Muslim world. I can't change everything. I've got kids to look at. You know, I, it, it would irritate me. I was like, you, you're asking too much. And even praying five times a day, I thought was too much. People have stuff to do. And um, so I stopped. So that was a while before I broke up with him. Um, and John could see it, and John didn't like it. He didn't like the changes he saw in me. Um, so what was the question again? So it was um, basically uh, what made you decide it was time to, it was time to, leave, to leave the relationship and oh, le- yeah. leave Syria as well? Oh, well, I, had, I wasn't supposed to go in Sy- to Syria in the first place. We were supposed to help the, the cause from Turkey because we, we had discussed this for so many years that I wouldn't go into Syria. And, and then I agreed Turkey because Turkey is a nice country and everything. But when we got to that side of Turkey, all I saw were refugees and I remember not being too happy about it. And, uh, yeah, that's all it was. <laughs> Cause it was a different place than it used to be. Um, but, and then we ended up going to Syria because we couldn't find any place to stay that night and we were expecting money to be wired to us that so didn't come. Um, and then we ended up being in Syria, and John was like, it's only going to be two weeks. And I was, I was fuming, man. I was barely even talking to him because I was so angry and and so it felt so betrayed because it wasn't even the first time he had done something like this. He he took me to Egypt, and I didn't want to go to Egypt. He took me to Mercy Matru up in the north coast, three hours away from Libya. I didn't want to go there either. Even Syria, the first time in 2003, I didn't want to go there. He told me we we're going to go to Jordan, but we ended up in Syria. So he, uh, he, he, I don't, he, I don't know if he's a sociopath or just an, like has no empathy at all. I don't know. But he, I, I was under his control because, and you know, I always think, had I been raised better, had I been raised. If everyone actually in school systems, if immigrants who don't hold the same values as us and uh, secular values and children need to know humanist values and and res- understand human rights to a degree, just so that when they do, when they're older and they come across something that is violating or exploiting um, young people, the young the young children will have the tools to understand that this is wrong, you know, what's wrong and what's right. I didn't have those, um, I didn't have that understanding because I wasn't taught it. Mm. Do you think um, there's any kind of problems in schools with trying to, trying to sort of um, please the local communities who have their religious beliefs and not trying to step on on toes? Yeah, they have to, one of the people always ask, why did I stop being a Muslim? Because I came across human rights, even the U.S. Constitution, which taught me about freedom and, and Bill of Rights. So I was like, these systems are nice. They they give you freedom. In Islam, you're born into slavery, and then and then they just want to enslave everybody else. And if we could just like uh, compare and contrast the two systems, clearly it you know human rights and humanist values are far more merciful and understanding to human nature than a draconian law that's also very misogynist. So, you know, we have to give the tools, we have to educate immigrants, we have to educate children so that they can, when they're older and they're exposed to wrong ideas, they can say, well, hang on, our way of life and our values are worth a lot more and are a lot more, um, you know, in line with science and 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 ethics. Yeah, and do, do you think men in Islam use religion to control women, or do you think it, it is actually part of the uh, the text, you know, or are they interpreting it in a way to 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 actually um, that suits them? Do you think? 
Oh, no, it's, ab- it's absolutely it's a male-dominated religion. We're in prayers, women have to stand behind the men, and not the men have to stand in front. They must be segregated. Women have to cover their whatever, and, and you know, men don't have to do as much. They, women go on about their rights, but they only, like, their rights are to wear gold and silver, and a man isn't. That's not really a big deal. And then the, you know, the marriage thing, women are so subordinated in Islam and it's in Islam. Like there are hadith sayings of the Prophet saying that when hell is full of women, more women than men. And, uh, and then like just the fact that every single part of our body is seen as being private and that we must be ashamed of the way God made us. It's so, so, uh, 1400 cent, you know, for seventh century way of thinking, and it's frustrating. Uh, on that similar th- uh, topic, like, um, where do you think the motivation for some Muslims uh, comes from for the, the jihadist interpretation of, you know, trying to kill infidels? Um, where does that come from? Because I guess you, you kind of yeah. um, experienced or, or, or yeah, you know, you, you mixed with people who had those views. So, where do you yeah, think it I comes from? Views. You know, it comes from our childhood. It comes from our home and what we're watching on TV. And is violence acceptable? And and do uh, do the parents use violence to solve problems? And and then, uh, you know, it becomes normal. And then if a woman, man gets beats up his wife in the family, it, the woman's to blame. And and you know, you know, so that that level of misogyny is it, it's an underlying tone in the, the Muslim culture and you know also other cultures so what about john though like your ex-husband um what was yeah. what, what's led him to sort of um you know even if he didn't like sort of western lifestyle like leave a kind yeah. of peaceful environment and that and now yeah. he now he's living in a very violent uh lifestyle you know and uh what, what makes him want to live that is it just the religion do you think no, well, he's in a war zone. He liked computer games and stuff, fighting, but, um, and he's Texas and he grew up in a, you know, military family, um, with, you know, his dad and his grandfather all in the military, but the father, his dad didn't serve. And then John, I don't know, John didn't feel loved where he was by his father and, that made that caused a lot of resentment, um, and they just they just didn't have any relationship. And uh, he also, John's family is very right wing, very very conservative right wing Trump supporters. They've always been that way. John, in his rebellion, went and joined what could possibly you know what could be more worse for an American Greek Orthodox religion family than having their son joined the Turks, you know, as they would say to the Muslims. Um, and, like, at first he was just into the Sufism aspect of re- religion, but then when he went to Syr- Syria, he met a lot of Pakistani, British Muslims there uh, who were all about um, jihad and, I don't know, they just knew more about it, I guess, and they convinced him and... Um, and then... Then he started reading, his Arabic was so good, he would read classical texts. And the Quran goes, I mean, I, I've got to make a documentary sometime where I point out all the verses in the Quran that are violent, that advocate violence and hell. And, and you know, even hell, oh, I'm going off a bit, but yeah, sorry. That was actually interesting, because I, I, um, yeah, I'm interested in how much... Um the Quran is being uh, misinterpreted by um, sort of the guys in ISIS, uh, or how much it actually is like fairly um, close to the actual text. You know, in in times of war, this has always been the way. In times of war, the rules might change; they get harder. Just like in American politics, in times of war, our freedoms are you know are more limited for security, right? So. Um, like, for example, 
it does most Muslim school, most Muslim schools of thought say you can show your face and hands and even when you go to Hajj you have to show your face and hands but then there's the few that that mainly the Wahhabis who say you have to cover your face um, and then so I was arguing this point when I was in Syria and I was like you know I know my rights you know because I've studied Sharia law I said I know my rights I'm not I don't have to cover and I'm pregnant I won't be able to breathe under that and um, they were like, well, this is time of war, you know, you're asking for trouble, like, you know, in, they didn't say it in a nice way, but they were saying I was asking for trouble from men if I'm not covering that up. And I was like, that's horrible, you know, that's so demeaning to, I, I, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. it's like I had somebody say once, an Egyptian man said, if there's a girl, if there's a woman wearing torn jeans, she deserves to be, she deserves to be raped, mm. you know. Uh, it's that mindset in the Middle East that totally cannot understand that mindset. I don't know how people get into that frame of mind. Is do you think that's anything to do with education, or is or what's yeah, that about? Yeah, it's social thinking. It's, it's a social thinking. It's Islam. It's holding people. Islam holds not just women back. You know, I I can give you so many examples of how it held me back, but. It holds um, the Sunnis and the Muslims, uh, Shia back. The way they argue about something that happened 1400 years ago between people like Ali and the people who opposed Ali and still today people are killing each other about it. This is ridiculous. Like, that's the problem with religion and especially with Islam. And I, with my, my new line of work, what I'm doing, I work for an NGO called, uh, against against violent extremism and we go we are trying to go into prisons and work with in uh, extremist inmates whether white-wing nationalists neo-nazis and and islamists and help rehabilitate them and we're going to do that through re-education and get them to under to, to learn hum, what are humanist values and the rule of law and um so you know just human rights they have to know these things and i'm pretty sure that if they don't know i'm sure they're not educated in these in these issues what about some of the guys that you know a lot of people have seen in the videos who, who joined isis and they're beheading people you know they've got you know a number of people lined up and they're beheading them one after the other some of them have come from england and uh um what um do you think yeah, I hope it, they die there. <laughs> do, do you think it's possible to get through to any of those guys? Like, if one of them comes back, do you think it's possible to um, de-radicalize someone like that? I think, I think so, but it would just take a, you know, it would take uh, a lot of time, mm. and it would mean removing that person from their social circle, their Muslim relatives, removing them from where they, you know, that's why prison is probably a good place to do it, as long as they're not, you know, they need to be isolated from Muslims, people that they can share their ideas with. And then, because my my idea, my program, the prison rehabilitation program, is about unindoctrinating them and, and re-educating them. Would that mean also that they'd have to drop their religion as well? Oh, that's up to them. If they want to follow some... Islamic re uh, sect religion that is completely non-violating in any single way, that's fine, but I don't know of any sect like that. <laughs> what do you think makes, um, you know, there's, there's been some, um, some women um, from various countries, but including the UK, who've, who've gone out and wanted to join uh, the ISIS men and become wives of uh, the ISIS guys. Uh, what, what motivates a woman to want to, to, to want to marry someone who is violent? I mean, I think in your case, John b uh, sort of became more heavily into ISIS later, right? So, but what oh, about so the women who, who know, they already know that um, these guys are beheading people, you know, what motivates them to actually think, oh yeah, this is the kind of guy I want to, to have a relationship with? Yeah, I mean, I guess they just see them the same way girls see met soldiers in the army, you know. They're big, they're strong, they're, they're sexy with their guns, they've got their beards, they're gonna, I've got a real, you know, like they think they're super manly. Um, I think it's just like that teenage crush thing, they don't, it, it's all superficial. 
it, um, but see, again, they're immature. They're, they're young, young girls. I've been there. I've done that. I know how silly we are. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to agree with that because uh, I'll get um, lots of insults from the, the female listeners. And so. <laughs> okay, so remove remove that comment from no, me no, too. No, 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 that's, uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, well, it's not our fault. We have hormones, you know, like in, and like there's so many like. So many problems for teenagers are just growing up and not, you know, trying to find who they are, and, and it's so hard when you're caught up in pop culture and and then you don't agree with your parents because they're migrants and they're dorky and they don't, you know, mm. they don't understand. I can imagine it was difficult. Yeah. Uh, how? Um. So anyway, you you fled uh, Syria and you've and now you're kind of trying to have a new lifestyle. How did you begin searching for a new partner? Oh gosh, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, yeah, I went online, just like I went online with John, and I, you know, it wasn't that I found Craig the first time. I went on, um, I was on match like three times. Um, so the first time I met somebody, dated him for five months, and it didn't work out. Then I uh, went on the second time, and I saw Craig. And I saw lots of other guys. So he was dating different people. I was dating different people. Then we started dating each other. Then we were together for two and a half years. Then he proposed, kind of. I made him propose. And then we were engaged. Then after New Year's, he broke it up. But, in you know, it was like a makeup breakup thing a lot. So And then um, there was a third website for Muslims. I was looking into dating, uh, marrying a Muslim. But then I was like, no, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm often I'm often kind of uh, interested in the um, the vast differentness between sort of uh, Middle Eastern cultures and dating compared to say the UK where you just you know you go to a nightclub or something you see someone across the room, uh, but in the Middle East you know in some in some places like Saudi Arabia literally you you have to you know it's it's all done between That's families and you have to decide if if you, the first woman you, you you choose, you have to decide whether you're going to marry her or not. Um, it's yeah. very 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 different. Like, um, w- yeah. have you experienced in the two different sides of that of the of the dating culture? Oh uh, yeah, so dating culture is really hard, you know. But I think, like I yeah, I, I arranged my own marriage with John. <laughs> I didn't want to let my parents pick anybody for me. Um, and I messed up with that when I was 19. I mean, well, seriously, what? You know, and my parents let it happen. So, um, anyway, so yeah, dating in the West is really hard. It's a terrible game. Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, um, there's probably there's probably criticisms you could that could be aimed at both types of um, mm. of dating methods. Which do you think but is worse? But I don't worse? like the bar. <laughs> I don't like the bar idea because I know, you know, when guys drink, they say all these sweet things mm. like "I'll marry you," <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then, so that's not a good place I believe to meet a guy. But um, I don't know. I, I, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I guess there is a perfect method. No, because the nice thing about like dating online is you basically see like a resume, mm. and you know, it's in writing, and so. And then, like, I would talk to somebody on the phone for two weeks before I met them. Um, and But still, the guys were such liars. I was like, you know, it gets tiring. Um, you, you mentioned before, uh, let's move back to religion again. You mentioned before that you're not a Christian. And, and I, I know I'd read that you were attending the First Unitarian Church of Dallas. What, what does, what's, that, what's that about then? Is that like a kind yeah, of inter- like interfaith church? Yeah, they're like Buddhist Christians. Yeah, it's in, they're known for being the Buddhist Christian equivalent, but right. don't accept the Trinity. Um, Charles, who's, uh, Charles Dickens was a Unitarian okay. in England, uh, so that's interesting. Um, but so, like, mainly the, the the church service just talks about all the good points about religion. Other stories, like by Mother Teresa, spiritual leaders, they talk about that in the ceremonies and. Um, and really, everybody, most of the people out there are actually atheists or agnostics, or and they've or they've come from another religion, like Baptist or or Methodist, and then they've become Unitarians. So it's a lot of people who want community life with like-minded progressive people, 
who, and then we work together to help Dallas. This show is called Truth Sentinel, and we're often we're often discussing the you know how to find the truth about religion or or, or other topics. Um, do you think there is a true religion out there, or do you think people are kind of trying to work it out for themselves? Are you trying to work out what the you know what whether there's a god and whether there's a religion that matches that god? My religious beliefs are I believe there's a source. And whatever that source is, I would say is God, but I don't know what the source is. Um, but I've come, I've come to the point in my life where I, I searched so long and I cared so much in my life that it didn't really get me anywhere. So now I'm like, okay, I don't care about God. I care about humans. I'm like, I'm going to focus on humans now. Like, you know, cause like, <laughs> shit, <laughs> that sounds okay. <laughs> Do you believe? Um, do you believe there is a good and an evil? Because uh, some religions sort of say there, you know, there isn't maybe uh, such definite poles. Um, I heard you talking about the dark side of the force. Um, <laughs> do, do you think that? Um, yeah. Do you think, for example, the ISIS men are inherently evil? Are they sort of possessed by some kind of evil? Oh, I don't. My kids educate me on on Star Wars because I'm not a big fan, but they're part of Star Wars cult. And um, they, what's evil about them is the indoctrination. The times when they do things wrong, but they justify it by the religious law, a law that is like barbaric and is, you know, like again, 1400 years old. Why, you know, that is, that's what makes them evil. I think if you remove the ideology, then they will become normal people. I heard that you said uh, that you would support your ex-husband becoming a martyr, and I was going to ask you whether you still maintained that. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, if the poor guy wants to die, let him die the way he wants. Let him die what he thinks is going to make, you know, he's a martyr, his cause. I, I think it's better than him coming back, being imprisoned and incarcerated for the rest of his life. I think it's better for my children also for him to pass away. Um you know, I mean, like, I saw him, how he ch was changing while he was in the war, and it, it, he's in a dark place. He, his, he, you know, it, everyone is clinically depressed on the brink of madness there. Mm. Uh, That's why I can't uh, understand why some of them don't just think, I don't want anything to do with this, and they're just like, I'd rather just yeah. live, you know, a peaceful life. It's because they either don't have a way out, like they're afraid, like they're all going back to prison, um, and they're afraid of losing their faith, or, or they just don't feel like they have anything else now to live for. So they might as well just die in the battlefield. Mm. It makes me very sad. John has two daughters; they're infants. They're younger than my my children, and it's just crushing. That I I was so mad at him when he had children. I just said, "You sentenced your children to death." By having them, I don't understand why people in war zones are having babies. Why can't contraception be free? You know, like that, it, give that to them as as well as food. You know, it's, I have all these strong opinions. Yeah, no, it's good to have strong opinions. So, um, Tanya, what's your what's your future plans? Then you're going to do this um, prison prison uh, scheme where you try and help um, extremists uh, de-radicalize them. Is 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 that your main goal at the moment? Yes, absolutely. Hopefully I'll be reaching out. I'll be working in the uh, Florida Tallahassee area where Jihad Jane and uh, Jaylene Young are. They're two people who were supporting ISIS and planning to go over. Um, and I'll also be doing some work in uh, a prison in New York City. Um, that's going to be hopefully like uh, CN NBC Dateline will be filming the giving access to the prisons so we can interview um, the inmates. Sounds good. And um, oh, I hope that goes well. And um, if you, you know, it's been nice talking to you and hearing your story. And uh, if ever you want to come back and tell us how your de-radicalization program's going, we'd um, love to talk to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that.